and welcome back to another episode of Beyond the To-Do List. I'm your host, Eric Fisher, and this is the show where I talk to the people behind the productivity. This week, I'm excited to share with you a conversation I had with Grant Crowell. He's a virtual events trainer. He's a creative communication skills facilitator, a neurodiversity speaker, an author. And in this conversation, he and I share some stories and some learning about how to use creative communication skills in the professional setting. So in the workplace, whether that's remote or hybrid, across all the different communication channels, I in particular share a story about clarity when it comes to using all the different social media channels to communicate on top of Skype, on top of Slack, on top of email, on top of phone calls, on top of texting, not to mention Zoom. And then we unpack that and start to talk about setting expectations and again, using creative communication skills to actually communicate. So if you've been driven crazy by all the different channels that are available to you to communicate and want to wrangle some of them in and set better expectations for not just you, but your internal and external communication, this is a perfect episode for you. So I'll get out of the way and just say, enjoy this conversation with Grant Crowell. Well, this week, it is my privilege to welcome to the show Grant Crowell. Grant, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Sir Eric. Boy, long time listener, now first time guest. Yes, and uh, (laughs) we should make this a fun one. I've been thinking and thinking a lot in terms of what we're going to talk about today in terms of communication and people that have listened to the show recently know there's been at least one or two episodes in recent history about the word creativity. And so we're going to do another definition of the word creativity today. But Grant, I'm curious if you wouldn't mind maybe elaborating a little bit or unpacking your story as to how you came to the role that you found yourself in, in terms of fascination with words and the meanings of them your meaning of the word creativity even, or creative, or both, and how that ties to communication. Glad to. Well, I jokingly call myself by my superhero name or my super weirdo name of being a twisted wordsmith. And I do have a job where I am able to use that. I, I've i worked a lot in information technologies on the enterprise level, but I've also worked on the creative side for the agency area. So I've had one foot in creative one foot in the logical and how to get these two factions of the brain or people with different brains to work together. So a little bit of my own background is I grew up in Hawaii, born and raised, and I had at the time of an age where ADHD, which I have now, I'm proud of that. But back then, when you're a kid, you have no idea what you have. I remember when my parents took me to a psychiatrist, I still have the manual typewriter letter describing everything, but not saying, oh, yeah, there's a term for this or this is what to do. So I struggled with a lot of stuff. I struggled with communication. I was missing other words. In fact, I have a little bit of auditory processing disorder. So now let's take something that is very physical on top of something that's neurological And boy, that that produces interesting words I would hear. Now let's also take that Hawaii is a place that has its own pidgin language. Like you might know in in Louisiana, there's Creole and other places with certain words, that kind of place where Hawaii is really interesting because pidgin is something that was actually derived for different cultures to get along. First really got to be noticed in the late 19th century where plantation workers that were segregated but had to work together in the fields or had to find ways to socialize. So they would take parts of Hawaiian, parts of English, parts of their own language, a lot of Pacific Islander, and put it into these new words. And I remember there was a fun book growing up in a kid in Hawaii called Pigeon to the Max. And all this fun things with words saying, you can make up your own words? That's amazing. Only later did I realize, well, all words are made up by someone, much as what's in the English language comes from other languages, just like there's Old English and Middle English. That's why I find it funny when people say that's not a real word, when I would always point out a lot of the words that are slang in some cultures eventually came over to what might be commonly understood as a lexicon. So I think that's because of how my brain worked a lot. And then I was a cartoonist, and I was a cartoonist for two colleges. One was Boulder, Colorado. I jokingly say my little bit of useless trivia is I'm the same age as the creators of South Park, so I was the actual cartoonist for the University of Colorado Boulder <laughs> newspaper while they were off at film school. And we know we know how that well well that worked out. <laughs> well, I also did at University of Hawaii, went back there and I would always want to sign my name in different ways. I wouldn't always want to do things one way. And that would get people talking. And 
I found that I won an award for the state of Hawaii just as a kid at the age of 20 with all these artists in Hawaii called Best in Communications. I had no idea what that meant. I didn't think I was great in communication, and I didn't understand how does that relate to art. Only later on did I really get that communication is an art form. It's something that can be enjoyed, that is pleasing, that there's a beauty to it. There is things that go along with creativity for the purity of it. Of course, as we know, a lot of things about art don't necessarily pay the bills. So I went from being a cartoonist. I actually worked also while putting myself in college and talk radio. Another form of communication, the analog way of here's the time, here's the weather, here's the news. Okay, now go into your banter and see about getting calls. And then I also worked on the side in a comedy club. I am definitely not funny, and I promise you I won't hurt you with any bad jokes. But I learned the different ways in person of how to be courageous, how to do things that may fall flat on your face, because that's how you learn. And this was all creative communication. So it was only later on when now the Internet comes around and social media, and I work as a social media director, and I'm finding interesting ways of how do you explore digital empathy, the ability to come across as a human being where there's a screen. I was never a really good marketer. I think there were just some things about it that I found too shady. However, I found I was a really, really good trainer and I could teach people, especially those in information technology where I work now and I've worked for other companies in the past to understand complex things in a simple way and have fun doing it. So what does that make me think about what is creative communication? Well, you're right. There are so many ways that people describe creativity. So how do I define it? Well, I like to say it's novelty meets value with a splash of fun. What does that mean? Let's break it down. Novelty is generally understood as what is new enough, but also familiar enough. If you go too far into being new, a lot of people get turned off by it or they just don't get it. If you go too far in being familiar, people get bored. You don't capture their interest. You don't stand out from the fog and the noise. Now, that's one part. The other part is the value. Where do people see the benefit of it in their lives? So you are being mindful often of context. And if you're working with other people in communication, that's social context. And then there's the fun, because fun is how we learn. We all need some kind of motivation. And fun, just like where it's rise from word funny, you can have it as humor or you could have it as enjoyment. And it's a great way for people who otherwise don't have anything in common to get to know each other and to be an icebreaker. I mean, on some level, I also consider it to be your willingness to use your imagination for growth, a better life, a better world. And it doesn't always need to have problem solving. A lot of times it's just for the enjoyment of exploration and having a growth mindset. I mean, I even have a fun word for creative communication called cool communication. Cool to feel like you're charismatic, confident, to have these now special abilities from your confidence you get. On the other instance of what is communication? Well, the easy term is it's the imparting and or exchange of information. So basically, there's the information side and then there's the delivery side. What do we expect from communication to be effective is that we understand each other, that we relate to each other, that we get each other. So that's why I like to say cool communication or just something that basically says you get me, you motivate me. And that's really why I want to explore being a creative communications learning facilitator. There are communications coaches. There's a lot that speak on clarity. But I rarely come across someone who understands the creative part, not just simply say this is how you want to be like in Toastmasters and to be a grammarian and always mind your P's and Q's or watch your ums or your filler words. There's so much more to it than that. What I like to do is help people communicate better and have fun doing it. So in my roles, I naturally came the person as I saw more and more of companies where there would just be information overload. And there is no truer example of that than working in IT, where there's a lot of smart people, but they're stuck. They're stuck sometimes because they're siloed. Sometimes their jobs require them to be very logical and they don't think about how can we make things better. There can also be people who are working in different time zones. It can also be that sometimes there could be budget limitations or technical limitations with that. And I also find that some people don't think of there's a better way. Like I could try to be doing project management and someone is using an old Excel spreadsheet, which is not meant for that. Or somebody may be sending 100 emails and wondering why people miss them. So I always thought that the way you can win people over is to first talk with them, get to understand why, have a conversation. And then the words that I would come up with for all these scenarios at work would get a laugh. Those laughs would make people who otherwise might have some resistance, some defensiveness to open up and then share stories. And from those stories, this creative communication got to a point of, all right, how can we make things better? 
And it's disarming. It lets people feel like, oh, let's talk about this. We're given permission in a sense, granting each other permission with the humor to be involved. So I, I really appreciate that. I'm definitely one of the ones who was always in the back of a meeting or even in college in the back of the classroom and would you know, kind of turn to somebody and make a joke. I felt that it would help me, one, pay attention, break up the classroom a little bit, and two, help me actually focus. So very interesting. It, it helps me focus all the time. Yeah. I mean, that's the great thing. I mean, there are people I work with who are neurotypical, which is a fancy way of saying those who don't associate with a spectrum like you and I are on the ADHD spectrum. I work with people who also have autism or Asperger's or dyslexia. It's very fascinating to work with so many different people in different cultures, different backgrounds, and to see new relationships. Sometimes I also learn about different languages and what a certain word or two might be especially relevant to them because of what they work with. And it adds levity, especially when there's a lot of stress because I'm very comfortable remote working. Other people aren't. They may have kids, they may have dogs barking, other things may be stressing them out. And I have to be empathetic towards that. So when they do open up, sometimes they'll ask me for fun words. Like I'll give you one that is very, very common in the IT space that allows for a lot of humor. I do say uh, as much as I love working in the IT space, every day is like a Dilbert cartoon. And there's so much material there. Uh, One very, very common thing is acronym overload. You will find people, whether they are putting on a presentation or in emails or whatever, they are constantly condensing words without explaining what those words mean. And this is a problem because sometimes when a company is so big, one team can have a different meaning for the exact same word, even if that word is a common word. It's just how they choose to use something, such as even on my own team, someone would say uh, that we had to get a new vendor socialized. Well, that didn't mean what actually socialized means. To them, it was just meaning, well, we just need to onboard them through the Dell processing system, which was actually a technical process and nothing to do with that. And so that's why it would confuse people, including the vendor. One other good example is I would see on a presentation, I remember one out of hundreds and hundreds of acronyms I would see that no one explained to me, uh, MOM. And finally, I would say, why isn't anybody asking about this? Do they know this? I found out several people didn't who worked there for years. So I just asked the person who was leading the presentation and she went, oh, everyone knows that minutes of meeting. And I said, why not just say meeting minutes? And then she said, well, isn't that an industry standard? I looked it up on Google. No, I asked two other people who worked at other IT companies saying they never heard of such a thing. I just realized this person was so used, so used to thinking in terms of acronyms. She was inventing her own acronyms just for a party of one. So that's when I thought I have to do humor. So my background is I have a graphic design degree. I also have a little bit of a video editing background too. And I thought, I'm not the best video editor. I'm not the best graphic designer, but I'm an interesting communicator. So I would create these nice little visuals or put up some videos on my YouTube channel over these things. And one that was pretty popular was called um, being acronym. When you're overwhelmed by all the acronyms, but then I would say, what's the solution is to be acronamaste, to be at peace with all the acronyms. So what I did, what I did from there is saying, everything should have a solution. It should have a story. It should have an actual story happening to me. I document that story in Evernote. And then I would say, here's some things you could do, like start a glossary, ask people what does it mean. If you're having a presentation, make sure you explain at the beginning, make sure you explain it again, or have some place that makes people feel like if you are condensing something, one version is a report, one version is a presentation. So that's just one way of how can you turn a frustration into a creative word game that actually becomes a solution at work. I would like to cross over into the storytelling section of this conversation. My personal story is one, I I started remote working back in May of 2014. Now, that's not to say I didn't do work outside of my main cubicle or office. Prior to that, I think, let's see, from like 2011, 2010, 2011 through to 2014, I would get out of the office occasionally to the coffee shop on the college campus I used to work on. But fully remote, you know, home all day, not going anywhere, you know, and and learning from that in the past, gosh, how many years now? So here's the story. Ultimately, at one point, I had a person that I worked with, and they were in a leadership position. And you never knew what that person was trying to convey, because their communication methodology, as well as channel choice, 
was all over the place. I'll, I'll give you some examples here. So one, you know, when we work, obviously email is still the standard. That's still a, a place where a lot of work happens. And we talk about that sometimes on the show. Number two, let's jump to Slack which is supposedly an email killer, though I don't know about that. There's still many of the same problems that email has, and then some that are tied up into Slack. But we didn't use Slack at that time. We used Skype. So Skype being a voice call possibility, being a, hey, got a sec, or you around? It was also kind of the time clock. And so if you were not around that often, it kind of gave an impression as to how many hours you were actually working or not, whether that was the truth or not remains to be seen. And then private messages through Facebook Messenger. Not only that, but text messages on your phone and or random, sudden, unplanned calls either through Skype or on the phone. So I think most people, as they hear me describe that happening, can identify what the problem is here. But I'm going to go ahead and just say, here's what it came across as, is that there's no standard methodology of proper communication in terms of where it's going to happen that's work-related and on a work channel versus on a personal channel. That's one, boundaries there. Number two is what's the escalation of how much of an emergency it may or may not be based on where the communication is happening. If you get a text message or a sudden call from somebody on your phone and it's your boss, you're going to think, oh, no, there's an emergency. Something's going on. Whereas if it's go back over to email where it's on my time to one, check it and two respond to it. So you can see this, this all starts to get muddled and you just don't know. And you feel like, uh, okay, to check in to make sure there's no fires to put out for this particular person. I've got to go check all those channels, which is obviously not the correct way to do this. And this is just with one person, let alone like this is a person who's setting a context for this is how we do it as a company. Why aren't you on TikTok responding to my messages? There you go. I there you know. go. Yes. Why aren't you on Snapchat? <laughs> it's, yes, yes. Yeah, it's, it's just getting to a point where people think that more is better when all it does is it's, it's messy tasking. I mean, I, I have my dictionary of hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of words, a lot that I include in my my book, Grand Tasms on, on Amazon, which which is a fun way. I call it creative twisted words for cool people, which is a way of just laughing about this stuff. But what I got the biggest response from was all the work stuff of the things you said. And a large part of that comes to the unnecessary overwhelm. What I call it is like being a really crappy multilinguist. Some people think that, why aren't you on all these spaces? And we're not even talking about marketing or any of that. And I worked in social media and I much prefer what I do now, but so much I deal still with is so many people, so many teams, so many organizations have the same problems that you that you just described. Setting understandings of context for how these tools are to be used, how they work with each other, how you escalate something only when necessary. Like a text message is the last space that my director might really need to reach me because other things are not there. But that's understood. It's not the first space. Just like I get really annoyed when people think that, oh, they see I'm in a meeting and they're just bored and they're in another meeting and they want me to text them back and forth. And that's another form of messy tasking. And I use that word instead of multitasking, which to me is a false term. That is just really, I mean, somebody could be juggling during a meeting and saying, it's okay, I'm multitasking. Same thing. It's basically making excuses for not doing what you're supposed to because you're bored or you're too anxious to give focus and feel comfortable with what you can't get done. Like just when we're talking about Slack, I used to be on Slack and I would come up with several words. One, slack a which was when you're so overwhelmed with Slack messages that it feels like it's crashing down on you is one. And I would use that. And then that was my fun way of saying, hey, my friend, uh, how about we use Slack a little less? You know, if things can wait, try to figure things out for yourself or let's just let things marinate. Let's things sit. And maybe when you have a bunch of stuff, that could be a good time for us to have a call rather than this constant slacking back and forth, which I call slacking on the whacking. It's you're distracting yourself from all this slacking rather than focusing on what you need to do. And I call another thing a slack shot. That was when you share a screenshot via Slack because something wasn't actually shared in a file. Sometimes people would do meetings and they wouldn't share the files or the deck of the presentation. So I would constantly take screenshots rather than saying to the person, can you make this available to everyone so we're not just seeing it for the first time? 
time, and some people might even be looking at it on their smartphone. There's no way that they're going to be able to zoom in and see all this. And so that's why I say it's like we're being expected to learn 30 different languages really, really badly. And humor is my way of tackling something. To your point, Eric, what I try to do, including where I work at now, is we identify which are the different communication tools. And communication isn't just talk. Again, it is the exchange of information and parting of information. That could be digital files. That could be your project management or task management system. That could be what are all the spaces and to set up a system for yourself and try to have agreement with other people who are in the same space. Like I will tell people, I check my email typically in the morning or near the end of work because we have an understanding that Microsoft Teams might be a space or if it can wait, we have this call scheduled or myself, I'm very much into Asana. So I'll be in that space to say, this is very, very contextual and trust the system. The problem is people don't trust their systems or they don't dedicate time to using these systems and put it in context. They just, sometimes it just gets plopped on you. It's like, go learn it yourself. And that's where a lot of problems happen. That's where people will just name their files, whatever. You can't find it anywhere. It's, it looks like a scene from Hoarders, just the digital version. And it, again, it's a situation of people who are smart, but they're stuck because they haven't yet had that invitation to a very important conversation that sometimes these words can be those gentle, playful reminders for, oh yeah, let's talk about it now. I mean, I, I have another word, multi-slacking. <laughs> it's like how you're on, how you're just using Slack too often to be rather than doing the things you should be doing. I like to say I'm great at multi-slacking. I can waste time, be unproductive and procrastinate all at the same time. People find that funny and now they're in a position to say, okay, where should we start? Yeah, I, I think that's that's key is where do we start? Because I think for me, I ended up beating my head against the wall so many times. For example, during a workday, the last thing I'm going to do is go look at Facebook Messenger and see that this person that I work with sent me a message there. I'm not going to see it. Not anytime soon, at least, you know, and it's like, well, if that's more urgent, then you really needed to drop that in Slack or ideally you would have dropped that in email. The bigger issue for me is I don't know that a lot of us know how to start having these hard conversations to broach the subject of, hey, can we maybe corral our communication into, say, these two or three channels total and if we can, like, stay off the personal stuff, like, don't call me, call me on Skype or ping me there and just say, hey, are you around or something, you know, and and I think over time I was able to train somewhat. <laughs> it was somewhat a losing battle, but I at least made some progress, I believe. But how would you suggest we start having some of those hard conversations? By start with having a hard conversation. You said it yourself. <laughs> you, you just said it yourself. I mean, this is what I, I deal with. I mean, part of it does come down to what if you're new to the team? You're going to have to understand how the system, broken as it may be, is so that you're in a position to first understand what is in place, even if a lot of things don't make sense. I found out when I first started my first year that half the information I was given was completely wrong, but then I could find who I could trust. Now, those people gave me wrong information. They meant well. Their information was just outdated or they made bad assumptions. And so I could kind of put together my own little CRM, but that was just for the company I worked at, a huge company, and figure out who could be reliable with sharing information. I also found who could I get along with, who understood the issue better, who could ask, who I could talk to about the why. Why do we do this? Like there are those with a growth mindset who do ask the why, and then there are those with a fixed mindset who don't question. And they might be good for certain jobs like security or finance, but when things you know, go wrong and now you have to be innovative under pressure, those people don't necessarily fit as well when there has to be a better system. And for those people who say, well, I don't want to be creative. Well, you won't want to be irrelevant either. And that's required, especially in an industry that's always, always changing. But life is always changing. So where do you start? Well, you can start with yourself. Do an audit of how are you using these communication tools, but also set a goal. What is your goal? A really, really easy goal is to say, I want to cut down email like 50%. No one will ever have in their tombstone saying, I wish I had more emails. <laughs> or no one will ever have their tombstone saying, I wish I could fit more bullet points onto a slide. No one will ever do that. Yet people complain about it all the time without doing it. So the way to first start something is 
kind of think, kind of understand your, your existing position, where you fit in, who can you talk with that you might already have trust and a good relationship about these things, get their ideas input. And I love mind mapping. I teach mind mapping to, um, to my team and other groups where I work at, which is great because it shows a different way of approaching information and seeing patterns. That's fun. It's dynamic and it's participatory. So I, I often do mind map for things like this when I have the opportunity to do collaboration, such as our team has about five different communication tools. I am a vendor manager, so I work with nine and I know the ins and outs. I know the people who build this stuff. I know the people who have to train others on this stuff. I train the trainers. So I understand the different parts, the different cogs of the wheel from what we have to do as a team so that I can be trusted enough to say, all right, now that I understand how things are done and building that kind of like work stream roadmap of how these tools are used or done, even if it makes no sense, but that's the information you've gotten, it shows you've been listening. So you start with listening. You document, you share and say, okay, I think this is this is how things are right now. And can we agree that maybe our biggest problem is too many emails or we get stressed out by using this or that and pick a goal? You can outline all the issues with it, but maybe just start with something that might be easy. Now, what I like to do, I like to do something where you start with a game. Why? Because games are motivating. They're fun. A good game is designed not just for play, but to be an easy win. Like how you get sucked into a game is it start off by being easy. So it gives you some confidence. So I might pick something that could be, all right, what can everyone relate to? Like if the internet goes out at certain times, I could say, let's pick a word for that. And I always have my own words where I can say, we, we don't have an internet, we have an inner not. And then people will laugh. And I say, okay, come up with something that could relate to a situation you deal with that makes you want to pull your hair out. And they don't have to come up with a word, but they can be on a team to come up with a word. So you start with the fun. Now you have the sense of easy accomplishment. Well, guess what? Now you're seeing the routine in there. You're seeing the methodology. So when a situation happens, you are not going to fly off the handle. You're going to think of, oh, I'm going to turn this struggle into a game. You've actually changed your mindset. The next step from there is have an agreement on now that you've had fun, now that you've had other people's stories with this experience, take the stories in there. So in a sense, you're kind of like being a little bit of a storyteller, but a story sharer. Now you can share that in a presentation. You can share that in for the first part saying, okay, this is what we understand. Here are some good quotes. So-and-so brought up this really good point. Now you make it inclusive to let's come up with a fun word or a phrase. It can be more than one that identifies it in a really simple, concise way, something fun that could really motivate people because everyone has that as the anchor for what's the problem they're trying to solve or how can they work better and have fun doing it. Yeah, man. And, and so I, I think part of it was for a long time there, you know, I'm going to go back to this specific example. It had just gone on for so long that now it was like, well, how do I possibly even bring this up as part of it? Right. And it builds up in your own mind. You know, it's like you, you question yourself and you say, well, is it really that big of an issue? I think you alluded to this or actually I think you said it outright is doing some of the research. So I think what ended up happening was is I ended up talking with other people that I was working with and Kind of without outright say, you know, placing blame or saying the system's broken or, you know, any alarmist type stuff. Just t started to ask them, hey, between you and me, what's your preferred communication pattern, channels, et cetera? You know, and, and so I went through, I think, a couple of weeks where as I happened to communicate with other people, I would kind of test their preferences. So I kind of would have my own research to come back with and then maybe fuel up and or create an outline that was simple and easy and, and not, you know, seemingly attacking or anything like that in order to have then that hard conversation. It's very smart of you to do that. I do the same thing. And I build up my own little personal library on people's communication styles. There was one thing I learned in my time at Toastmasters that for me was great on understanding there are different communication styles, just like there's logical and creative. Some people are personality driven. Some people are storytelling. Some people want the data. And I often found that if I would have someone who says they like a spreadsheet, so I'd find a compromise. I might find something like in Microsoft Teams, there's an app called Microsoft Lists that can combine some parts, but it's much better suited for the job. But I would first try to learn it enough, show an example to say, 
hey, I, I know why you you like things in a very structured format. I think this would work especially well for getting the job done because we have to work with other people. So sometimes I'm persuasive to say it's not just about you and it's not just about me. It can't always be what I personally like or even what I think is best. It is about getting along and being persuasive with other people that you are thinking about their best interests and the best interests of the team. And also, in our case, the business units we have to work with. Sometimes they work with different tools. Sometimes people are nothing but email. And part of that might be there might be restrictions for the types of communication they can do for security issues, which is common in IT, especially with all the hacking and ransomware that's been going on lately. So I try to ask, is there a reason for that? And if I can get one, then then we're getting somewhere. And we can say, well, how about this or that? And sometimes some people are just in a space where their own work culture doesn't encourage that. So you try to be an outlet and show that you're listening and find something that's an easy solution. So I do the same thing that you mentioned. If somebody has like is more of a spreadsheet mentality, I might find a tool that can dynamically change the information I have to a spreadsheet and maybe back to a mind map or I really enjoy project management. Well, there are multiple project management tools between different teams. So how do we make them get along? So I might use a tool in Asana that can work with email, that can work with other platforms just enough and then to say, hey, can we be in agreement that we'll use such and such for this? Now, anything you want outside of that can be just for yourself personally and other people can join or not, but just set up an agreement over what is a basic level of use for these tools so they can all get along. So you know what you're doing is you're being someone who is trying to make your tools, your digital platforms, your digital ecosystem get along itself. You're kind of like the translator for your team and for these technologies that probably maybe they integrate, maybe they don't, but they are just as important in the mix as us organic life forms. Well, I'm glad you brought up uh, project management tools as well, because actually that was another whole thing that I didn't bring up in my story. But that is yet another place where crossed communication or cross channels or crossed wires and again, signal to noise ratio. You can get a million notifications out of Asana or Trello or what, you know, fill in your tool here into your email if you're primarily an email worker, but uh, that doesn't mean that everybody else is going to follow along with you and get those updates as well and receive them at the same time you do so that if you make a change inside of a tool, suddenly they're notified about it and then do their appropriate next delegated action. In, in other words, without having these protocol kind of conversations, whether you're just stepping into a new organization or a new role or a new team, let's put it this way. To a certain extent, most people don't create the culture. They are lazy about it and or the culture that's created is created unintentionally. It's by accident, but make no mistake, there is a culture there. And so then <laughs> you end up having to traverse and or try to figure out, or like you said, learn the language of that culture as to, wait, now, is this an established thing or is just is this just the way everybody's always done it and no one's questioned it and so on? Yeah, I mean, I would learn along the way from being a really good listener, taking notes like, you know me, I have my Evernote because it's quick, it's fast. Sometimes things are going so fast, I'm able to use it to take a screenshot and I type fast. And interesting enough, I use Text Expander. Text Expander is a great creative communication tool. It solves a problem for how to put your notes down when you're probably having to work in shorthand and save time. And the other part is, OK, anything that makes sense can stand being mocked. If it can't stand being mocked, it needs to be fixed. Like. I remember when one person I was working with, a senior to me, and she was always complaining about the notifications, but I wasn't getting through to her about how to turn off her stuff because she wouldn't take the time to just learn the tools uh, given. Some people resist. And so I would just throw out the word when it happened, no to friction. So it was the, the tension of all of your devices, your apps, because you haven't simply turned off the dang settings or you haven't changed the settings. So I started doing videos and I started sharing these things because I found I could use humor and then the word would show up and it would just be one word in there. But sometimes I would do a second word. That would be a way of, all right, let's find another word for the success that you will have for making this really important change that is supposed to be fun along the way. And, and that way, it made progress. And you're not going to make all the progress. I, I don't call it a battle. You're working with people. And when you find these fun words, sometimes they own it. They themselves use it. And sometimes they will come up with their own words. Sometimes they'll come up with words to 
be their their own personal brand, their own identity. For example, what people would like is I use the word I don't describe myself as ADHD because there's a stigma about it. I don't personally have a problem with it, but some people feel negative about it. So I could either call myself attention dynamic hyper focused dude, another acronym for ADHD, or I call myself a GERC, which is my word for a geek nerd and dork who is striving to be an awesome social citizen or grandtastic. And people like that because now they associate you in a positive way. So when a situation that's a problem comes up, they already see you as the fun person to work with. Not fun as in goofy, irresponsible, just as in, you know, I got stress in my day. I think I'm going to enjoy this or I think I'm going to feel a little more comfortable about when something happens that I can be myself. Yeah, I I totally vibe with that. I totally get that. I And I typically don't tell people in terms of, you know, my ADHD, I don't bring that up. It's more of a, oh, if they convey something or if they, you know, if it's appropriate in the conversation, especially if they say that they have it, then it's like, oh, well, I'm going to extend the olive branch and let you know I understand you to a, an extent that other people won't, <laughs> in other words. So. Yeah, yeah I, I have a word for just like you said, you are mindful of social context. There there are those who, and I think this is a part of those who haven't yet fully managed their ADHD. I call them the an ADHD Jesus freak, where they could be on a job interview and they're saying, hey, well, let, let's start the interview. And they go, blow it out. I have ADHD. <laughs> like, they just can't, they just can't control themselves. And I ha- I used to be that person. And I find that even with some people, and this is just one of many different things that make people different. And different is really good and important. But just as important is knowing when to blend, knowing when to understand the culture, knowing when to be amongst the apes in the jungle, shall we say. And and that is being mindful of social context. You're right. It's like I don't hide it, but I just tell people this doesn't make me better or worse. It is a series of traits that now I'm in a very fortunate position over decades to be like you, comfortable with talking about and helping people. But it isn't all who we are. It's an interesting thing about who we are. And we attract other people like that. But there's so much more, uh, so many more traits, so many more life experiences. I even dedicated a chapter in the book on ADHD. But it's just my way of saying, hey, it's there when when it's something you have and don't don't know how to deal with it along the way. You're going to come up with a lot of funny stuff. Yeah, I, I and I think that this is a particularly you know, unique time in the world in terms of there was a lot of people who were forced to completely upend their normality in terms of communication and move to remote work. And the other piece to that is, is then a lot of people now are moving back to offices or a hybrid model of some sort or are settling in for the long haul on remote work and haven't thought about I mean to be honest some of the stuff that we just talked about and and we were describing story wise solution wise are part of why this you know aside from the uncertainty of what's going on in the world today that was one of the other major stressors for people who were not used to remote work especially when it came to communication checking in Receiving and giving directives, delegation, communication, all of that stuff. So this is a very unique time. I'd love to direct people as to where they can connect with you in terms of your training, as well as your book, as well as, you know, all the good stuff you're doing. So. Well, well, thank you. Well, I, I definitely want to object to that. So I'm an easy fellow right now because I'm not doing all the marketing. I'm more like the regular Joe, but I do have a large body of work from just being on the interwebs for so long. You could Google my name and see so much stuff. So for some very important focus, there is my book, Grand Tasms, Creative Twisted Words for Cool People. Uh, it's one part is a lot of laughs, a lot of how to be creative and have fun doing it with twisted wordplay, whether you're a punster, whether you're just looking for icebreakers. And the other part is stories, is story sharing and my story. This was originally meant to be a book just to get that book out and then see what happens. And that which has led to so much good stuff, including the second book I'm working on called Uisms, which is communication games for different brains that is on schedule to also go out on November of this year. However, without getting too ahead of myself, because ADHD folks sometimes have a habit of talking a lot about things and thinking they've done it. They've convinced themselves they've accomplished it. No, no, no. But on LinkedIn is a really good place to find me. Grant Crowell with two L's on the end. I put out now lately a video a week. I actually have a video on my latest thing called Echo Nuts, which is when you have so much room reflection in your noise, other people hear it and it's really hard to hear on Zoom calls. That's a really good example about what we've been talking about today. In just a very fun video, a story, some tips, I share the DIY sound treatment I have in my room, what you can do with a professional or what you can do if you 
don't have control over that, such as how you can turn the sound down in Teams or Zoom or other apps. So I like to give those tips in LinkedIn. First and foremost, I love connecting with other professionals who share with me their stories. And finally, I have a YouTube channel and that's just Grant Kroll. I've had it since 2005. I used to do a lot of documentary video work on there. I have a lot of clips that show my journey over. I did a series called What's Your Social Beef? We're talking with people about what really bothered them with communication on social media. This is a precursor, but those also have my videos on there. So it's book on Amazon, Grantasms, LinkedIn, YouTube, really easy ways right now. Get to know me. I love hearing people's comments. Ask me for help if you're looking for a word to describe a struggle or if you got one to share, because those will be on future videos. So get to know me and let's see if we get each other. Awesome. And I'll make sure to link up to all those things in the show notes for the episode. Grant, great talking with you. Thanks for being here. It has been fun communicating with you, Eric. Well, that's another podcast crossed off your listening to-do list, and I hope that you enjoyed this conversation with Grant Kroll. I hope that this got outside of the box for you in terms of thinking about how we have been boxed in by communication tools. Tech tools that are supposed to elevate us to a new level, that are supposed to allow us to do more, feel like they force us to do more and communicate across all those channels and can be a bogging down and a focus fracturing echo chamber But I hope that you got something out of this conversation. And if you did, I would love for you to do me the favor of sharing this episode with somebody that you know needs to hear it. Just hit that share button on the podcast player app of choice where you're listening to this or head on over to the show notes at beyondthetodolist.com and hit the share button there. Thank you so much for sharing. Thanks for listening. And I will see you next episode.